Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Father's Day to the men. The fathers, would you please um, come to the front? We have a little something. I'd like to share something to you all. If the fathers, if I can have you come to the front, please. And as you are coming to the front, I'd like to remind you all that it's not just Father's Day. Now, I think we should recognize fathers more regularly, aside from just once a year. You have this horrendous task of keeping the families together. And God has tasked you with this responsibility, not only as the father or the husband of the home, but you have been called the head of the house. And as such, your responsibility is to lead by example. So you're to protect the family and you're to be the spiritual guide. Now, maybe you don't have kids anymore. Maybe they're not in the home or maybe you don't have any kids, whatever the case may be. You still have a responsibility of looking around you and seeing who you could impact. You could be a major influence with the kids around you, uh, your nephews and nieces, or people at church. Maybe you have kids at the church or maybe you know children because God in his omniscience knew that fathers would play a very important role in the transformation of a culture. And so please know that we value you, whether you're online or you're there in Elisa Viejo. We all value you. You're all um, uh, loved and we treasure you. And so please know that uh, the world around us, the culture itself can be influenced by your involvement. Now you might be saying, well, how can I get involved? Well, the Bible talks about this blessing by association. And because of who you are, as a believer in Christ, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, you can directly influence the people around you just by your presence. You don't even have to speak much, but just by your lifestyle and what you do, how you conduct yourself, that God, the Holy Spirit takes that and impacts the people around you. And so I've been saying for the longest time throughout my ministry as a pastor, we have this major impact by our lives. Romans 12, one comes to mind that we ought to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, which is really our reasonable service to him. And so just know that we have this huge responsibility as fathers. And so you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm done. I lived my life and I don't have much of a influence anymore. No, 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 no. That's not true at all. You're just starting. And so I can give you story as a story after story of people in the old Testament who have made major impact regardless of their age in their latter years, their younger years. Uh, it doesn't matter. It really depends on you. And so remember who you are in Christ that makes a world of difference. There are many fathers around the world, fathers in our vicinity, who have dropped the ball. They abandoned their kids. They're no longer caring for their homes. They've left the, the home itself. But you're still there. You still have family. And you can still be a major player because of who you are in Christ. It, again, it doesn't matter what your age is. God has reserved you for his plan. He's not finished with you yet. You just have to trust that. You have to trust in what the word of God says. And so as long as he gives you breath and as long as you're here, he's not finished with you yet. He has a plan for your life and mind. So just know that, gentlemen, uh, that God is not finished with you yet. He loves you and he's preserved you thus far so that you can impact the culture around you. Yes, the culture. And we don't have enough people today who are willing to represent him. And that's why I always stress who you are in Christ, okay? So this little gift that you have, that you receive, that's just a small token of our love uh, for you. 
but just know that God's love has been bestowed upon you 2,000 years ago through the person of Christ Jesus. So he also loves you so much so that he has given himself for you, not only for you, but for the world. So we appreciate you, Father. So please take your seats and thank you so much for what you do. Please don't ever think that you are not important. You are just because of who you're, who you're aligned with. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes a world of difference. Please know that. So, as you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a moment of silence so that we can prepare ourselves for the intake of God's word. And today we're going to deviate from phase two salvation or discipleship. And we're going to look at the characteristics of a righteous father. And before you say, oh, I know what that is, we're going to look at someone who is not really considered a righteous father, but the Bible says he is. So... Let's pause for a moment of silence and utilize 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. With our heads bowed, and once we pray, I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what a splendid opportunity it is to recognize the Father's who have this horrendous task of being a representative of yours, taking care of the home, being a husband to their wives, and a father to their children. We know that this is not an easy task to juggle all of these responsibilities, loving the wife, loving the kids, paying the bills, working, taking care of things that we often don't think of, that only a father is aware of. And so, Father... <clears throat> I just ask that you would bless the men in such a way that they would recognize that they truly are loved, especially during this day where we annually recognize the fathers. And so I just hope and trust, Lord, that they would be um, renewed in their excitement for you because of their, their um, involvement and their relationship to you. I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would just renew them in such a way that they would see the value of who they are as a father, and not only just as a father, but a father who is in Christ, not everybody can say that. And so now, Father, as we look into your word, I just pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would help us see these truths so that we can make adjustments and application in our personal lives so that we can bring you honor and glory in all that we say, think, and do. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, guys, I'm going to first read. If you have your Bibles, you should have a Bible. It's always good to have a Bible like this. We're going to start with Genesis 19, Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to go through and read the first 29 verses. If you don't have a Bible, I'm just going to read it anyways, but it's a good practice to bring a Bible to church. Now, some of you may even have a digital Bible, and that's perfectly fine. But, you know, I'd like us to go back and have a Bible, get familiar with a Bible, because we, we, we lost that touch of having a Bible in, on hand. And I think we should go back to how they did it before, and that's to have a Bible and be able to know where the books are. We don't know where the books are because we have a digital Bible, and so all we have to do is punch Genesis, Matthew, and then it'll automatically take us there electronically. 
And again, that's perfectly fine because of our the technology that we have today. But it's also nice and special to be able to know where the books of the Bible are by being able to flip to it because we're familiar with the Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you to get one because there's nothing like looking at the Bible on hand aside from just digitally. You can use both, but I like the idea of going back to having a good old Bible in hand. That's the way they did it before in the ancient world. And I think we should get accustomed to it as well. Genesis chapter 19. This is a very familiar <clears throat> chapter. We're only going to go through 29 verses. And you'll understand why we're looking at this. Again, the title of this message is Looking at the Characteristics of a Righteous Father. Genesis 19, beginning with verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he arose to meet them and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Verse 2 says, And he said, Hear now, my lords, please turn in your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. See, in the ancient world, they would travel and they, they use sandals. And so their feet would get dirty. So he said, wash your feet before you come in. This is a Filipino house. And they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. So they initially declined and said, thank you, but we'll just sleep out here in the open square. But he insisted strongly so that they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So they had a little fellowship there. Okay, They got together and ate some unleavened bread. Verse 4, this is where it gets really interesting. They lay down, the men, now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom. So the men of the city, okay, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, listen to this, surrounded the house as if they're going to run into the house and knock the house down. They surrounded the house and verse five, they called out to Lot and said to him, where are the men <clears throat> who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. And the idea here is they wanted to know these men sexually. They wanted to rape the men. We, want, we may know them carnally. Verse 6, Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Listen to what he did. Verse 8, See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. There's this answer, right? There's a solution. The mark of a loving father, isn't it? Uh, let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Just leave the two men alone. That's with me. Take my daughters instead. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under my roof. The shadow of my roof. Verse 9. They said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the door, against the man Lot, and came near to break down the door. Do you have the visual imagery here? They said, no, take them out. We're going to do to you and them. So now they were worked up. They were upset. They said, okay, not only are we going to rape this guy, we're going to take care of you too. So they were furious. I want you to see the aggressiveness of the sin nature at its peak and who was there young and old of the city it goes on to say verse 10 but the men reached out let me start with verse 9 so we can get the flow of this and they said stand back then they said this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge now we will deal worse with you so he's going to rape 
he's going to be raped himself, then with them. So we're going to take care of you and them. We're going to we're going to be harder on you than these guys, the guys with you in the house. We will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. They were furious. They wanted to rape the people in the house. Who did they want to rape? They wanted to rape now Lot and the two men. So the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house. What, what men? The angels. From verse 1. Pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Verse 11. They struck the men who were there at the doorway of the house with blindness both small and great, so that they became weary. It's another word for weary, tired. Tired trying to find the door. So let me let me give you the picture here. <clears throat> All these men, young and old, were coming and pressing into this door, wanting to rape Lot and the two men who were with them, with him. And they were pressing on the door, but they were now stricken with blindness. And they were trying to find the door, but the scripture says they became weary, meaning tired, trying to find the door. So what I'm getting at here is they were they were getting tired, worn out because they couldn't find the door. So here they were, their, their lust and their sin nature was at its peak, roaring like a lion, and they're still trying to get in, trying to find out where Lot was, First of all, where the door was, because they wanted to uh, honor their word by raping Lot and the two men who were angels, right? So this is the sin nature at work. And so think about this, please. So that's why I understand that, you know, it's not easy to be a Christian. In fact, it's impossible to be a Christian or believer, which is why I've spent over a year now and trying to pinpoint and precisely point you to phase two salvation. Because in phase two, that's where you discover how to deal with what these guys are wrestling with. Their sin was so aggressive and strong that they were pursuing these two angels and Lot. And here they were, I mean, I don't know about you, but if someone... If these two men that I wanted to rape, if that were me, I was part of the city. If they struck me blind, I would think twice, wouldn't you? Hey, wait a minute. Those guys that I wanted to rape um, just caused me to be blind. And here I was still trying to find the door. I wouldn't even pursue the door. I'd be like, I'm out of here. There's something with these guys that are different. I'll just get lot later on. But their sin was so great. Right? The sin nature was so aggressive among these within these men that they were getting weary trying to find the door. So please notice that the sin nature, when it's ramped up at its max, it's hard to stop. This is why, as a pastor, I'm wanting to dial in for the believer how to overcome the sin nature. Because this is how it looks like in the life of individuals. These are people who are lost, who are led by their sin nature, following the lust patterns of the sin nature, who have no control. And they have no, no regret, no, they don't have any kind of control over their desires at this point. And here they were struck with, uh, struck with blindness, and they're still trying to find the door, hoping they can go in and fulfill their lust, which is to rape the three, the two men and Lot. So they became weary. Verse 12, then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and who, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, exclamation mark. Get them out of here. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent, sent us to destroy it. So now they, re they reveal the reason why they came here to the city. 
They're going to destroy the city. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, verse 14, who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Yeah, whatever. Did you just purchase some real estate last week? You're now telling us we got to go. They're going to destroy this land. Yep, sure, right. His sons, verse 14, and tail end of 14, his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. So they didn't believe him. Isn't that the case with most people when we try to share the gospel or share some kind of biblical truth? They don't believe us. Yeah, you believe in God? He, you still believe in that antiquated individual? Isn't he dead? When was the last time he answered your prayer? So they thought he was joking. Verse 15, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry. So now there, there's expediency. Get up. He urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. You better get out of here lest you die with what was about to happen. Verse 16, and while he lingered, that word lingered means as he delayed, as he was thinking back and forth, he was pausing. Verse 16, the men took hold, listen to this, the men, angels, took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. Why? Because Lot just, he wasn't making a decision to go. He was warned to go. And he was sitting there, no, uh, I'm happy here. You get this sense that he's comfortable. You remember, he's been there now for a while. He was involved with politics. He was a judge. He's sitting at the gate. So that's the idea of his position. He, was, uh, he had a political position. So we can get, when you do some background, you have a sense that he had a pretty good job. And so... He was hesitating, the scripture says. He lingered, verse 16. So the men, the angels, had to take his hand, his wife's hand, in the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out to set him outside the city. So God's angels had to take him out. He, they already warned him, but he sat there and he lingered. He was, he didn't want to leave. So we can come up with all kinds of reasons why he was hesitant but the the sense that you get when you read this is that he was probably so accustomed he kind of got comfortable with the culture and the people and he didn't want to leave them he already knew that the city was going to be destroyed think about it why would you stay there why would you delay why why would you linger around when you are you were already warned to Get out of there. Take your family out now. Why would you linger? Uh, all right. He, he didn't even rush. He did talk to his son-in-law, but he was still delaying himself. He, he lingered, verse 16 says, and the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, in the hands of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Verse 17. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. So, very specific instructions. Then Lot said to him, Please know, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot go escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. It's too far to run all the way there. I'm gasping for air. I can't. It's been a long time since I ran. Um, then he goes on to say. Verse 20. See now, this city is near enough to flee to. There's a city right there. Can I go there? And it's a little one. Please let me escape there. It is, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. 
Instead of going over there, can I just go to the city right down the street or a few miles away? I don't think I could make it over there. He goes on to say, <clears throat> he said to him, see, I have found, I have favored you concerning this thing also in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. So the, the angels were saying, okay, go ahead. I can't do anything. I can't rain fire and brimstone here until you're out. So you can see the, the grace of God that he wasn't going to allow Lot nor his family to suffer with the unrighteous. Okay. So you hear him say, hurry, escape there. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Verse 23. The sun has risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord, this is where we're familiar with, the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So fire came down and burnt the entire place. Then the Lord rained. So he overthrew this, those cities, verse 25, all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So vegetation, it was all destroyed. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. She died, she became a pillar of salt. Abraham, verse 27, went out early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. So smoke everywhere. Why? Because the entire city was burnt down. And it came to pass, verse 29, this is where we're going to end here, as far as the reading is concerned. When God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities which he had dwelt so now let's look at the slides here and i'm going to make some comments and um put it here you guys know who the righteous man is yet I'm going to put some of the slides up here so that we can uh, re remember and recall some things. Look at uh, verse, this is chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself to the face toward the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go in, the, in your way. So I basically said, look, stay with me. You don't want to stay around here. This is, this is LA, right? So you don't want to hang around here. And he, he knew the city quite well. So we probably get the sense that he knew that this would not be safe for them to hang out and sleep outside. So he said, come inside and stay in my house. So look here and notice, see if you can see if the two, the, within the two verses, some <clears throat> characteristics of Lot in these two verses here. You can see hospitality and kindness right away because he says in verse two, turn in your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that then you may rise early and go on your way. So you can see the hospitality and kindness by inviting two strangers into your house. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a cultural honor and is necessary as travel in ancient times could be dangerous. So he's very thoughtful, hospitable, and kind by inviting them into his house. Then you have these two verses, four and five. 
Now, before they lay down, the men in the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young. So notice the age here, old and young. All the people from every quarter surrounded what? The house. So we read this, right? But I'm wanting you to see, uh, again, characteristics of Lot, just in these two verses here. They called Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. That word know, see the word carnally, how it's, um, remember when it's indented like that, it's not there in the English. In the original text, it's out. And the word that's there is no, and it comes from the Greek uh, Hebrew word yada, yada, and it has it has the idea of sexual relations, yada. Bring them out to us that we may yada them, yada eighth, yada eighth, eighth is them, the word them, and yada for no, and eighth is for the word them. So, so yada, he let us. Bring them out to us that we may yada them carnally. So it's the idea of sexually in, sexually involvement, sexual involvement with these men who are angels. So I want you to see something here. Again, the characteristics of Lot here. In these two verses, Lot's willingness to protect his, his the two men that stayed with him. Please read the two verses. He were, was willing to protect them by going out and confronting the angry mob. You see that there, right? Before they lay down to sleep. So they're about to sleep. Now they're getting a pounding on the door. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, the city of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, so coming from every side of the city, surrounded the house so think about this how would you feel if your house was surrounded with people and they're angry and look at what they said where are the men who came to you tonight they're yelling through the doors how would you feel if people were yelling at your door through the doors of your house bring them up, out to us so that we may yada them carnally think about that your visitors, the one that you put up, and typically you house the visitors for about three days. So now Lot is trying to be hospitable, and now the characteristics here is that he's willing to protect them, and we find out that he goes out, and we'll see that in the next verse. He goes out and confronts them. So notice. Then the men said to Lot, Okay, looks like I go back. Did I? Where are the men? Bring them out to us. So we, okay, I guess I don't have that slide here, but um, verse six is what I'm missing. So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him. So again, the point being is that Lot was willing to protect them by going out. He shuts the door be behind him and he confronts the people. And basically, that's another characteristic of someone who would, would be considered righteous. And you'll understand this uh, by the time we're almost done with this lesson here. So... Um, we saw that he was um, hospitable, um, caring. We also noticed that he was um, kind. And now we're, we notice that he, verse 6 actually, he was willing to protect them, the, the two visitors, by going out and running the risk of being jumped himself. Okay. So now let's go to the next slide. So when you get to verse 12 and 13, you know, we've, we're skipping quite a few slides, but that's why I read it initially so that we don't have to go through each and every slide. But the idea here is then 
you get to the point in verse 12, the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? So please notice their concern now. Do you have anybody else in the area, in the city? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whom, whomever you have in the city. Take them out of this place, exclamation mark. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. So please notice, observation. Who's going to destroy the place? We will. We will. So the angels have supreme power. God has given them power. We've seen, we have see this throughout the Old and New Testament. The angels themselves have enormous strength and power. We will destroy this place because of the outcry against them has grown great before the Lord, before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So we're going to destroy it. So before we do, do you have anybody else here? Son-in-law, your sons, daughters, and wh whomever you have in the city, take them out. This is going to be a mess. Take them out, stats. Take them, get them out of here. So <clears throat> that's 12 and 13. 14 and 15 reads as follows. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. So after he gets the word that you got to, whoever you have here, go and tell them what's going to happen. Get them out of here right now. So Lot went out, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who married his daughters and said, get up and get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be what? Joking. So sometimes we talk to people about important biblical truths and they think we're joking or they make little of it, right? They make light of it. Ah, whatever, Fred, whatever, Arnie. You, you guys are always doing this study. Yeah, whatever. So now Lot is trying to get them to leave because he knows that the city is going to be destroyed. And now he's talking to his son-in-law, right? Get up and out of this place for the Lord will destroy this place. But to his son, sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. That's verse 14. When the, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of this city. So you can see this, you got to go, we're about to do, destroy the place. Tell your son-in-law, your son's-in-law to get out of here. If you know anybody else, get them out of here because you don't want to be left behind. And isn't that what we're talking about today? We don't want people to be left behind. We don't want people to miss the rapture of the church. It's a different kind of message today. This city is literally going to be burned down and destroyed. But what I have been advancing the past year now is getting everybody to play ball and get the word out because we just have to be proactive. We can't be lackadaisical when it comes to the gospel. God is counting on us to advance the cause of Christ. And there's only a few reasons why you would not and you have to search your soul and ask yourself, why would you not when you know that eternity hangs in the balance? Okay. So arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. So please notice 14 point of observation. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters. Some commentaries will say um, they weren't married yet. They were espoused or they were engaged to be married but please notice lot went to speak and spoke to his sons-in-law who married his daughters so they were engaged they were not fully married yet they have not consummated the marriage yet and said get up and get out of this place for the lord will destroy a city so lot went and talked to who potential sons-in-law who are uh, engaged to marry his daughters right Drop your eyes down to verse 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, 
take, take who? Take your wife and your two daughters who are where? Here. So just observing the text, you can see that there are two daughters who are with him here. And then you have the two daughters who are with the sons-in-law who are engaged. They haven't fully been married yet, but in 14, he goes out and speak to the sons-in-law who had married or who are, who are engaged to his daughter. So whether you take this as uh, two other daughters or the same in verse 14 and 15, I just wanted to point out that if you drop your eyes in 14 to 15, you'll notice that there are daughters in 14, daughters in 15 who are there with Lot and his wife. So two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in this punishment. So in this context, you see the responsiveness and the concern. The quality of a good father, a, a righteous father, is someone who is responsive and concerned. So he gets up and he goes and talks to the people that he is concerned about, that he cares for. So you can see the responsiveness and the concern based on his actions. He went out, spoke to his sons-in-law, and then now he's being told by the angels, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here with you, lest you be consumed in the punishment of this city. So this is where now we look at verse 16, where I mentioned as I was reading it that he lingered. Right. So if you weren't if you didn't have a Bible, now you can see it right in front of you in the monitors here. While he lingered, he hesitated. The men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters. Hmm. The point being. Is that. When God is going to. <clears throat> unfold judgment whether you call it the wrath or judgment. And here it's going to be judgment. He's going to uh, destroy the city. Lot hesitated, and we can speculate why. And I again, I think it's because he became so comfortable and he, he knew everybody there and he just kind of, oh, well, you know, they're all my friends anyways. And the choice of word that he used in verse seven, if you have your Bibles, he said, please, my brethren, do, do not do so wickedly. So <clears throat> this is where he offers up his daughters, remember? So he said, no, leave these men alone. Here, I'll give you my daughters instead. And so <clears throat> in verse 16, you get this sense that he lingered and hesitated, maybe because, you know, he was so comfortable with his job and career here as a judge, as someone in politics, that's the sense that you get because he's at the gate. This is where major decisions and business transactions took place. So he had a prominent position being that he was at the gate from the very beginning in verse 1, 19, 1. And so he lingered. Maybe he was thinking like, well, I'm going to miss everything here. I mean, I had a good position, had a good job. Company paid me well. Whatever the case may be, he hesitated even after being told that the city was going to be destroyed and he saw these two angels cast blindness on the people who were trying to break down his house i would i would be like okay the angels said they're going to destroy this place so i'm out of here but verse 16 says he lingered so what did god do in his mercy notice what it says the men took hold of his hand his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. Why? The Lord being merciful to him. So sometimes when we're hesitant and we drag our feet, it's God who's going to nudge us. He's going to get us through. He's not going to want us to be where the wrath of God is going to be felt. So he had to force Lot out of there. I thought, I thought that's interesting because... God listened to Abraham's request when you um, notice in verse 29. Let me read 29. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, you can look there too. 1929. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities 
of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities which he had dwelt. So God was merciful. I'd also like to read a passage that you are all familiar with, I believe, in chapter 18, 23 to 33, that will add some impact to what we're reading and seeing here. Chapter 18, 23 to 33. If you don't have your Bibles, bring it next week. But I'm going to read it for the recording and for you so you can hear it. 23, chapter 18, 23 to 33. Listen to this. You, you'll recall. Uh, we've all heard this growing up. Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you spare also? Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? In other words, God, would you destroy the city if there were 50 people righteous? And then he said, far from it, for you do to, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of the earth do right? Then in verse 26, 18, 26. So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the entire place for their sakes. If I find 50 righteous, I won't destroy the city, but I don't think I'll find 50. So Abraham continues, verse 27, Abraham answered and said, indeed now I who am but dust and ashes, I'm a nobody, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? He said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Notice the numbers are decreasing. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. The numbers are decreasing. Then he said, let, the, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. I will not destroy the city if I find 30 righteous. It started from 50. It's now down to 30. When you get to verse 31, and he said, indeed, now I have taken it all upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Looking pretty good, right? Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. But once more, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham was trying to negotiate with God. He said, look, would you spare the city if there was 50? 40, 45, uh, or 50, 45, 40, and got down to 10. And why didn't he go down to one, would you think? We, I mean, he could just continue to decrease the number, right? But um, he didn't. But suppose, <clears throat> suppose, He did go down to one. Abraham said, suppose there's one, would you destroy the city? What do you think God would say? The numbers were decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. Um, if there was one righteous person in the entire city, would God destroy it? Well, my thoughts are as follows. I think that God would still destroy the city but he's going to extract the righteous one. Because even though the numbers were decreasing, that doesn't mean that the entire city isn't evil still. It is. So the intention was to eradicate all the evil. 
because it went before the Lord and he said, uh, this, this has got to stop. So, and actually that's what happened. What we're seeing, isn't it? There was an entire city that surrounded the house of Lot that was wanting to rape the two angels and Lot himself. And the sin nature was so bad and the sin was so evil there that they were willing to break down the house and try to get to Lot. And they were saying, look, we're going to go after you and do worse to you than the two men. And by the way, um, think about this. Why was the city fixated on the two angels? That leads me to believe that these angels must have been really good looking, must have been handsome, because they are equated to men. Let us to the men who let us get to the men who are with you, right? And so the angels must have been really attractive. Today's lingo is probably fine, right? Handsome. And so the city, young and old, wanted to get to them. So the angels majority of the time are masculine in name and in appearance. And as I said earlier today at national, I had pointed out that, you know, Hollywood has portrayed angels as female and the scripture always uh, portrays angels as masculine, Gabriel and a host of other Lucifer. All the names are masculine, never feminine. Though I am married to an angel, my wife, she's the only angel that I'm aware of that's female. But um, <clears throat> so you can see the subtle changes when Hollywood gets involved. So here's a guy who offers his daughter to a homosexual mob when under pressure and a father who could not think properly when under pressure. So think about this. Are you concerned about your family or friend? Well, the Lord being merciful forced Lot and the family out of here, out to safety. The men took the hand of Lot because he hesitated. Well, as, as well as the wife and the daughters. So even though they hesitated, God made sure that they were going to be safe from destruction. And the angels took the hand, the hand of the lot, wife, and the two daughters. So we sometimes worry about our loved ones who are kind of bouncing around in life. They're just wondering, where, where are they today? Well, God seems to take care of those who are in him, believers in him. And so I'm going to point something out now and show you the true essence of Lot himself. Because I as, I, as I mentioned from the very beginning, the characteristics of a righteous father, right? And I'm equating the righteous father to Lot. So please notice what Second Peter 2, 7 through 8 says about Lot. You have the following. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man, Lot, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So I know Lot hardly comes across as a righteous man, but godliness was not a consistent mark in his daily conduct, as we've seen in the, the chapter of, that we read together. So, but in this, but his standing before God is different from how we see him externally. His actions, take my daughter, um, and how he dealt with, uh, he was hesitating. So, you, you have an insight into the life of Lot here based on 2 Peter. I'm going to read it from a different translation now. So, listen to how this translation renders it. Verse 7. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Verse 8. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day by day. So this was Lot. 
in reference to Lot, 2 Peter 2, 7 through 8. He was miserable while there. So he was being tormented in his person, in his soul, day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So isn't that like us from time to time, right? We, we struggle with the sin. We struggle with the things we know to do right, and we don't. The things we don't want to do, that's what we do. That's what's taking place here in Second Peter. So Lot, notice the word righteous, dikaios, is mentioned three times, to be clear. And delivered Dikaios Lot, righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of, of the wicked. For that Dikaios man dwelling among them, tormented in his Dikaios soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So apparently Lot was troubled and tormented by all the things that he saw. And yet at the same time, he hesitated, even though he was told that the city was going to be destructed. So we sometimes can see the reality of, of individuals in the Bible, right? Lot seemed to, he was a righteous man before the eyes of God, but he was not a perfect man. He was not a perfect father. So this is for you fathers, right? We're not all perfect. And so we can see the shortcomings of Lot. He made some poor decisions based on what we've read, right? And yet we can see that in the eyes of God, we're still in good standing. Why? Because he was Tikaios. He was justified in the eyes of God. Second Peter 2, 7 through 8. He delivered who? Lot. What kind of Lot? Who? What did he call? What's preceding the word Lot? Righteous Lot. You're only righteous by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. You can't be called righteous unless you have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, meaning you believed in him who was oppressed. So now let's look at the doctrine of righteousness. This will be important to see. This is also taken from Thames Bible Doctrine Dictionary. It's important to know. When it comes to righteousness, since we saw that he was Tikaios, he was righteous, we have to understand what it means. So you have the divine attribute of righteousness. It's the absolute incorruptible perfection of God's person and character. That's a part of his essence. That's his attribute, okay? Now, we also have the righteousness in the believer, which exists in several categories. And so, like in salvation, we talked about phase one, phase two, phase three. There's also different categories of righteousness. Now, I know you're probably pulling your hair and saying, oh, I don't want to hear this. It's very important to hear this because this will help you advance a, as a mature believer. You must know these things. Because it cost God his son. So the righteousness in the believer exists in several categories. Can you name them? Maybe not. So I'm going to put it out here for you. The first one is called imputed righteousness. Is God's own righteousness attributed to every believer at the moment of salvation? This is why... Lot was called Dikaios, righteous Lot, because he has the righteousness that was attributed to him at the moment of salvation. You can't be righteous unless you first receive the righteousness of God. He finds support for that in Genesis 15, 6, where Ab Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him at, for righteousness. Uh, Romans 3.22, Genesis 15.6, uh, Romans 4.1-6, 21 to 25, Philippians 3.9. So that's imputed righteousness. That is not relative righteousness. That's not the righteousness that we can do in our own strength. That's like filthy rags. So please make that distinction. There is a righteousness that we can do on our own strength, which on the surface, it looks nice. We're we're feeding pigeons. We're helping people cross the street. That's a relative kind of righteousness that is contingent upon the energy of the flesh. So these are things, as I'm sharing these, 
you should be asking yourself, do I know this? Because if not, this is why the spiritual maturity is where it's at in your own life, in my own life. If you don't know these things, well, that's why you're not going to be able to go up that uh, ladder of spiritual maturity unless you know these things. These are truths that I'm bringing out for you and I to know. You should know imputed righteousness is God's righteousness that has been given to you at the moment of salvation. You also have Continuing on with imputed righteousness, not even the best efforts of fallen man can produce a righteousness that is acceptable to God. But the Lord Jesus Christ came, became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's that word in again, right? Second Corinthians 5.21. So when a believer believes in Christ as Savior... God the Father permanently imputes or credits his own absolute righteousness to that believer. The undeserving sinner on the basis of this judicial imputation is declared justified and righteous in God's sight, acceptable to the perfect divine standard. Romans 3.24, 4.5, 5.1, Galatians 2.16. God is now free to personally love and bless the believer without compromise to his character. If you don't have this righteousness, guess what? What I just read here is the reverse. God is not going to be free to love you and bless you. It's only when you have his righteousness. So that's important to know. You see that there right here. God is free, now free to personally love and bless the believer without compromise to his character. So he doesn't just accept anyone. God is perfect and holy, righteous and just. The only way he can love you personally is when you have his imputed righteousness because he can't love sin. So if you're without the imputed righteousness that comes ultimately from God, he can't love you. He cannot love you personally. He can love you impersonally. And that is another topic altogether, another lesson altogether. These are things that you should be able to interact with in your mind, just as I'm doing now. This is the mark of someone who is grounded in Bible doctrine. So I'm sharing this so that you can see how I'm communicating this to you so that on your own, when you think of righteousness, you should be able to think, okay, there's imputed righteousness. That comes from believing in Christ that is distinct from the righteousness that comes from us on our own there's a righteousness that comes from God himself and that's how God is able to love me personally he can't love me unless I have his perfect righteousness so here we go So this is another way of saying plus R, it forms the receiving end of the grace pipeline through which flows every divine blessing of salvation, logistical grace and super grace, prosperity, Matthew 6, 33. You have lastly, what's called positional righteousness. It's one of the unique benefits to church age believers who by virtue of their position, position in Christ, position in Christ, share all that Christ has and is, including his righteousness. And then two more here. Experiential righteousness, it's the integrity and spiritual capacity developed by the believer in his post-salvation life. The term is synonymous with godliness, is used in the New Testament to refer to the lifestyle of the believer living in obedience to God's mandates, growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Experiential righteousness is potential, not assured after salvation because the believer must make repeated decisions to learn and apply God's word under the filling of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, you have the perfect or ultimate righteousness, which is really when you're raptured out of here or you take your last breath. That's the time you experience the ultimate righteousness when you are face to face in eternity with God himself. So now 
Let us close in a word of prayer. I just wanted to bring that to a close so that we can see. I know it's Father's Day. Some of you might have plans after this. So let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll, um, I'll see you next week. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to look into your word. This is where we grow spiritually and advance in our spiritual lives as we intake your word. So I pray now, Father, that as you go before us and watch over us, that you would keep us all safe. I pray that the men who are fathers here would be um, blessed on this special day, that they would enjoy their day, the rest of their day, together with their families, friends, and relations. You would keep them safe and allow them to remain healthy so that they could represent you wherever they go. Pray now, Lord, that you would um, be with us as we close this service. Be with us in the sense that you would bless our thoughts, actions, and our words as we continue to represent you wherever we go. And Father, I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I believe we're going to partake in communion, so I will just um, close this portion of the, stop the sharing here. So if you have <clears throat> any, if you have a cracker or juice, you can um, certainly join us if you're online. We have a few of you online. Good to see you all. Uh, we're about to partake in communion, so um if you want we still have a second or two just grab a cracker um and we will partake in communion and i'm going to share something from first corinthians chapter 11 as customary here so as we're uh as the Elements are being dispersed and handed out. We'll just partake together. And then I will open and close in prayer with these uh, between the bread and the juice. But if you're following online, just I know that this is primarily a message towards the fathers, but this applies to all of us, uh, male and female, because we can see how the sin nature works, and we can also see how Lot was considered just, dikaios, in spite of his outward behavior, which is important to know because sometimes we see people who live lives that are not reflecting the Christ-likeness that the Bible commands. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a Christian or they lost their salvation or any of those, because it's not contingent upon behavior. It's contingent upon new birth. New birth is what determines whether or not a person is in Christ. It's not how they behave. It's not what you do or don't do. It's based on whether or not you have rapport with God. And that only comes through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Okay, so now 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says the following. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Father, we thank you for these symbols that as we partake in the wafer, the cracker, or the bread, which we have before us, that we are declaring your son, Jesus Christ, as a remembrance of what he has done 2,000 years ago. We're proclaiming his death. And by partaking in these elements, we're saying we want all of you. The, be the bread, of, of, as we see in scripture, represents his body and the juice represents his blood. So now 
We're about to partake in the juice. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. <clears throat> and he closes out by saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So in closing, as we conclude the Eucharistic or the, the Eucharist or what's known as the Lord's Supper, please recall the things we've studied together this afternoon and realize and recognize that the grace of God trumps any sin that we may have committed in the past, in the present, or any struggles that we have. Everything that we've just read together today shows us the reality of the sin nature, which is why God gave of himself through the, the, his, the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and we've just now partaken in the communion. Uh, the bread represented his body. The blood, of course, the juice represented his blood. And in this is the new covenant. And because of this, we have new life. And we have access to the spiritual assets that is ours as a result of being a child of God, adopted into the family of God. And so regardless of your struggles, just know that God is there. He's in your corner. He's going to help you through the use of Bible doctrine. He's going to help you through the filling ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, as you continue to walk by means of the Spirit, as you continue to abide in his word. These are the things that you're going to see over time. As you take seriously the word of God, and don't just take it lightly, but guard it, protect it. And remember what Psalms 138.2 says, that God himself magnified his word above his own name. And so we should take seriously everything that's recorded in the word of God and utilize it to our benefit, to our advantage, so that we can bring him honor and glory because he alone is worthy of it. So let me close in prayer and then we'll, I'll see you next week. Father, it is a special day indeed, recognizing the Father's um, being that it's Father's Day today. And I pray that the men here listening online or even in person in Elisa Viejo, that they would recognize the depth of the love that you have for them and for their family. And that regardless of the struggles and the challenges that come with life, that you are always there willing to assist and help and to intervene, just like we saw with Lot. Sometimes we're stubborn. But you will take us through. You will see us through so long as we're willing to adjust accordingly. Father, we're stubborn at times, but at the same time, we do our best to um, accord with your will and your way. And so, Father, we have access to a power that's greater than our flesh, greater than our sin nature, namely God, the Holy Spirit. And I hope and trust that as we continue to advance in doctrine, that you would allow us to see how blessed we truly are amidst a culture that is going awry because they're being led by their sin nature. Allow us to be representative of yours as we are salt and light, but remind us, Father, that we don't do this in our own strength. Could it be that we're tired because we're trying our best to live a Christian life, a believer's life, when in fact we're never told to live a Christian life on our own. We're told to be filled with the Spirit, to walk by means of the Spirit. And that is not something we do on our own. It's not a matter of committing or promising anything to you. It's just a matter of learning the dynamics that comes to the inculcation of Bible doctrine. So please bless everyone that is listening to this, whether they're in San Francisco, Sacramento, up north, Lord, or in Arizona or even here in Virginia, I pray that you would just continue to work amidst us all 
and allow us to uh, recognize the supreme privilege we have serving an awesome and sovereign God. And I ask and pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you all. And I will see you next week or during the week if you are a part of our studies. We are going through some good biblical doctrines. So join us if you can. God bless you all. Bye-bye.